This is Myla Lippin, Editor-in-Chief of Dizzy Magazine, and I will be reading our interview with cover artist Makoto Kobayashi from our sixth issue. Makoto Kobayashi's shop out of museum feels like an anomaly in Tokyo. Many of the antique and thrift shops I've visited, particularly in Shimokitazawa, the shop's neighboring area in Setagaya City, typically carry Japanese and American products. Kobayashi's shop is inhabited with relics from different corners of the world, coming together in a way that somehow makes sense. The unassuming and subtle facade is welcoming, with its gray door often left open. It feels like you are entering a secret. Stepping inside the shop, you are immediately confronted with a maze of objects, forced to choreograph a path to the back wall, which is covered in printed ephemera. Behind a curved glass window, Kobayashi's desk sits near packed bookshelves. His curation is delicate and intentional as he intersperses his own artwork throughout the small space. Finding insects and other wild elements as a child, sifting through nature magazines in his parents' bookshop, and accumulating precious items on international trips with his wife and children, Makoto Kobayashi describes this desire to collect as a habit. Kobayashi's sculptures, constructed using various found objects, live in harmony beside other figures of similar scale. He manipulates man-made materials from around the world, created and touched by many, and now him. There is no ego in his space. He is not concerned with distinguishing his own art from his findings. The selection Kobayashi presents is constantly shifting as he pulls from his vast archive, which extends from his home to a storage space. When he is ready to let go of the objects, he is generous. I have walked out of the shop with a Spanish matchbox and Russian postcards with photographed felt dolls on them. Makoto Kobayashi's process is led by instinct. The details in his work are dense yet accessible. A game console button is disguised as an ear, an old newspaper article fashioned into a cube, and a piece of coral sits next to a metal syringe. The pieces are precious. They are meant to be touched and their histories are meant to be shared. Makoto Kobayashi rarely stops smiling in conversation. You can sense the peace he has found in this environment. In the following interview, I will be referring to myself as ML, Makoto Kobayashi as MK, and Kai Tanikawa Oglesby as CTO. Myla Libin, where did you grow up? Makoto Kobayashi. I am from Shimasua in Nagano. It's about a three hour drive from Tokyo. ML. When did you move here? MK. I moved here when I was about 20 years old. ML. What brought you to Tokyo? MK. Since I was a child, I stayed in my mother's house right next to the Meiji Shrine for a month to a month and a half every winter, so Tokyo was familiar to me and I had many acquaintances here. ML. Did you collect things as a child? MK. Insects are what I collected the most. I would walk around in the mountains to collect insects every day. I collected various natural objects like bones from deer and other small animals, rare plant leaves and seeds, rocks and minerals. I'd pull wings from dead birds. I always collected things like that and brought them back to my room. Those were my summers. My family had a bookstore, so in the winter I brought a lot of encyclopedias insect-related books and animal books into my room, and collected a lot of materials and photos on natural science. I also collected animal models. At the time, they were only available at Isetan in Tokyo. They were various miniature models of animals made in England. I collected a lot of them and made my own dioramas. ML. So you were already starting to set up the things you collected as a child. MK. I would make a mountain from resin or clay, put soil on it, and set up the collection of animals. ML. When and where was the first place you traveled? 
MK. The first place I traveled to was Atami in Shizuoka. I often went with my father around the age of kindergarten and spent the summers there. ML. Did you have interest in traveling outside of Japan growing up? MK. Going overseas was not common yet, so there were not very many people who traveled abroad. Around when I was in junior high school, average people started to travel to places like Hong Kong. Since no one around me had ever been abroad at that time, I watched the documentary TV show called Wonderful World Travels and studied places. That's where I learned about the natural environment of Papua New Guinea, the people of Africa, and various primitive arts. I also loved the Native American culture and was fixated on watching the rainmaking rituals on TV. ML. When was the first time you traveled outside of Japan? MK. Around 1979, I traveled to the west coast of the U.S. for the first time. Back then, I didn't have much information and didn't even realize that the only means of travel was by car, so I hitchhiked. I was 19 years old at the time, and everyone treated me like a kid, asking why I was traveling without my parents. There was an older lady that I met at the gas station, and she took me around. That's kind of how my trip went. ML. Were you starting to collect things at that time? MK. It was my first trip to the U.S., so I collected Tropical Deco, a tropical twist on Art Deco style, souvenirs as well as costumes, vintage Hawaiian shirts, pottery made in Japan for exporting. I also bought non-American things that came from places like Cuba and Haiti. ML. Do you still have any of those things? MK. I still have them, and they're in the back of the warehouse, so I haven't seen them since. He laughs. ML. Your parents had a bookstore. What kind of books did they sell? MK. They didn't sell specialized books, just ordinary novels, comic books, picture books, anything from elementary school kids to adults. ML. You were mostly looking at books of animals, natural science, documentary, nonfiction. When were you exposed to art? MK. I don't consider them art. I started to think about art when I was about 20 years old. It started from pop culture. In the mid-70s, hippie culture merged into the new wave culture, and values of young people began to change. Rather than protecting one style, there was a trend of mixing various styles, and I connected with that. ML. When looking for and finding objects, ephemera, folk art, do you know immediately that you will incorporate it in your art, or do you come back to the whole collection later when beginning a piece? I love the idea of you having a catalog of materials that also serves as a sort of museum or art piece in itself. MK. I create in both ways. Sometimes I gather objects after deciding on the theme, and other times I randomly collect things thinking that they can be used for something in the future to put together like a puzzle, and relying on happy accidents. In my recent work, I've been primarily doing the latter. It's a process called bricolage. People like Native Americans used to collect various things in the mountains, and if a situation occurred in their lives, they would use what they had collected in order to overcome it. I don't make a blueprint before I create. I combine things for the first time, and they become what they are, by coincidence. When I look at the finished work, I enjoy seeing that I've created something I've never seen before. ML. Are the histories behind your found materials relevant to the artwork you're creating, or do you view them more as materials akin to paint, wood, or paper? MK. I don't think too much. I look at things a bit more intuitively. ML. Are there any things in your collection that you would not use in your artwork? MK. I wouldn't say never, but I don't want to fiddle with natural objects. For instance, I use wood that has been cut and shaped by humans, but I rarely use something directly from nature. ML. What's interesting about your shop is that it kind of blends together your artwork and the collection. They almost become objects as well. Is that part of it for you? seeing them exist beside other things you've collected. 
MK. I think that the energy I felt when I collected the objects can be sensed. I think the same energy echoes within the space. ML. I wonder what happens to the energy when you're constructing a piece. You're using objects from all different places and histories. Kai Tanikawa Oglesby. Does the energy shift or change even just by you touching them alone, based on who has touched them or where they've been? When they get combined with other objects, does that shift the energy too? MK. I think of everything as an aggregate of energy, and I believe there's good energy and bad energy. Just by moving something from here to there, the energy that it emits will shift. Even if something blends so well into nature, the energy and the influence it can have on someone could change drastically just by bringing it to the city in a completely different setting. I'm really interested in this shift. Things at my shop are here because I happen to feel some sort of energy from them and brought them back. It could be fate, or maybe they sent me some sort of signal and I received it. Each piece can have a totally different effect on different people who come here. They are saying so much without saying anything. CTO. Do you ever come across objects that you feel have negative energy, that you just don't want to be around and need them away from you? MK. Yes, I've seen many. I think the mental state of the creator influences the energy of the finished product. If someone is very sick, suffering, or struggling, it goes into the work and it's hard for me to see. On the other hand, looking at natural objects is like seeing the soil within nature, so it feels good. ML. Is there a certain headspace that you have to be in for creating art? Is that something that is important to you so that it maintains a positive energy? MK. It is important for me to be in a good mood, a state where I'm not thinking and my head is empty. I don't want any plans in my head, just an absent mind. It's better if I'm not completely conscious, with only my hands moving subconsciously. ML. When you're not working with found objects, like screen printing, does that feel like a different process for you than when you're using the found objects? MK. It feels a bit more like work. The process becomes more technical and it doesn't feel like I'm doing the work. ML. You also had a Thai food restaurant. Is cooking also a big part of your life? MK. My mother was a cooking teacher, so cooking feels like a natural instinct to me. ML. Does cooking feel similar to creating artwork, putting the ingredients together? MK. Yes, it feels the same. For me, it's more interesting to cook up something unexpected from ingredients on hand. ML. When did you decide to open out of museum and share your collection? MK. About a year and a half ago. ML. So everything before existed in your own home. MK. They were mostly in storage. ML. Are these newer things you've collected? How do you decide what to bring into the shop? MK. I don't think about it too much, but I choose what's in front of me, whatever is easiest to reach. My old collections are way in the back. He laughs. So I choose from where I can reach. ML. Is everything in the shop for sale? MK. Some things are not for sale. Some can be sold immediately. Some I wouldn't sell immediately. And some are not ready to be sold yet. I decide to sell things when I feel like it. Other than that, I keep some things kind of as a photo album for memory's sake. Things my kids made or experimental things I made when I was younger. ML. Talk to me about your son because he is also an artist. MK. One is a contemporary artist. My older son lives in Laos researching insects. ML. What places have you visited? Your kids maybe took some of that from you, like insects, traveling. MK. Since I liked insects, I've taken them along to places like Indonesia, Malaysia, and Borneo solely to collect insects ever since they were old enough to travel. ML. Do you have a favorite insect? MK. All of them. I can't choose. ML. Where are some places that you haven't traveled to and would like to? MK. The place I've been wanting to visit recently is Nagaland. 
Nagaland is a state in northeastern India. Other places are more primitive places like Papa, formerly Irian Jaya in New Guinea, and places in the Amazon without too much civilization. I feel the best energy when I visit places where it's just people and nature. ML. I feel like a lot of people don't realize that these places exist, or they aren't really touched. MK. Many people don't know. These places take a lot of time to travel to, which can be a reason they aren't touched. ML. I know that there's indigenous Japanese people. I knew people. MK. There are many places throughout Japan where religions remain and festivals and rituals are held while also living modern lives. Japanese people have always had an animism belief and regarded nature as gods since ancient times. CTO. Do you meet a lot of people in Tokyo that still live according to these values, especially the younger generations? I feel like it's still there culturally, but not actively in their brains as much. MK. I do think there are many people that live in Tokyo while thinking of how ridiculous life is here. ML. Would you ever leave Tokyo? MK. I do want to leave Tokyo. CTO. Do you want to leave Tokyo or Japan? MK. I want to get out of Japan, but my wife and others around wouldn't let me. He laughs. My wife was born and raised in Tokyo, so it's hard for us to leave. But we are moving close to the seaside in the Enoshima area starting May of next year. We don't know for how long yet, but we are going to test it out. CTO. We were talking about the mindset you have to be in when you make your work. How does it differ when you're by the seaside versus in Tokyo? MK. On the seaside, a lot of the energy comes from the sea and nature, so I think it's a more natural feeling. Living in Tokyo, there are so many rules you need to abide by, even where you can and cannot cross the street. These small levels of stress build up, but perhaps the seaside would free me from them. ML. I don't know if you call yourself a collector in that term, but I feel like a big part of it is being really dedicated to collecting, and I wonder if there's ever a point where you would feel like you can't collect anything else, if you would reach a limit or if it's endless. MK. I wouldn't consider myself a collector. It's more like a habit for me. When I go to the mountains, I somehow pick up tree buds. Like a hunter-gatherer, I bring back something wherever I go. I'm not deliberately collecting anything. It's naturally how I've become. ML. So it will go on forever and ever. MK. I don't think I will ever stop. The artwork is courtesy of the artist. Photography by Myla Libin. And the introduction and interview is translated by Reiko Lux. The feature on Makoto Kobayashi begins with the full spread it is a photograph of the open door to his store out of museum. The inside of the store is mostly cast in shadow, but you can see a few things inside, including a clock with a blue border and some wood. To the left of the opening is the corner of an artwork leaning against a bench. It is a collage of airplanes against a blue sky with clouds. To the right of the door opening is a little sign that says out of museum and on the bottom we can see one of the metal chairs that is outside of the shop. On the upper left of the photo is Makoto Kobayashi. Under it reads out of museum in blue. And then to the right of that there is a rusted big key hanging from the door. The second spread in the Makoto Kobayashi piece is the introduction on the left page written in English and on the right page written in Japanese. The artwork shown are various woodblock with newspaper collages on them. On the left side, the piece is untitled from 2018. It is woodblock newspaper nine height by 1.7 width by 1.7 depth inches. You can see bits of the newspaper, 
including Spanish words, we see nos enseño sancta para santa, the end of what looks like Martin Luther King's name, La Habana. The other side of the piece is an article about Che Guevara. On the right side is the other sides of the piece, which also have political figures. The newspaper is black and white with yellow. There is then a portrait of Makoto Kobayashi in his shop. He is wearing a yellow shirt and smiling. Above that are other little pieces that look like knobs and have newspaper wrapped around them. On the right page is another piece. It is untitled from 2018. Wood Black, Joan Miro print, geological diagram from an architecture magazine. 1.9 height by 1.9 width by 1.9 depth inches. The third spread have two large sculptures, one on the left page, one on the right page. On the left page, it is untitled 2019 woodblock newspaper acrylic dice handles and plastic video game console buttons 16.5 height by 5.9 width by 3 depth inches. The sculpture on the left has black, white, and red geometrical shapes. The top of the sculpture is triangular and the head of the figure is a cube. It says Mexico, Panama on the top, it has dice for eyes and a red nose and mouth, and wooden handles for ears. Pieces of newspaper wrapped around the rest. Some of the words are cut off. The bottom part, you can see Cubana written. The sculpture on the right is blue, red, black, and white. The head of the figure is blue and says Economica on the very top, has a pointed black nose, circular eyes, and a red mouth, and white handles for ears. There is newspaper wrapped around the neck of the figure, and the body is a trapezoid on top of a rectangular cube that says 1977 in red. Under that is a blue and white cube, and it stands upon what looks like an upside down pot. 15.7 height by 13.7 width by 3.9 depth inches. On the seventh page is another wood block print newspaper piece. We see all four sides. It is yellow, red, black, and white. And there are people printed on two of them, historical figures as well as text on one of the sides that reads Laza in a very pretty kind of filigree print. And then on another side it says wool in red. 4.7 height by 1.5 width by 1.5 depth inches. On the eighth page is a silkscreen print on cotton. It reads fetish tour on the top of the print in red and green colors and underneath the print is black with yellow images on top like insects and skulls. The piece is untitled 2008 silk screen print on cotton 17 by 14.5 inches. inches. On the ninth and tenth page of the feature are photographs from inside Makoto Kobayashi's shop. The left page has two photos, one on the top left, one on the bottom right. Some of the things we see are a wooden plate painted with flowers, a little glass vase with flowers in it, a Pillsbury Doughboy looking sculpture, a little card that has a black and white image of a woman in lingerie, it says 090 Lick and has a kiss mark and more information, a framed collection of different metallic colored flies, books, and more objects. On the right page, it is somewhat of a collage of photographs. The one on the top left is the back of taxidermied birds. To the right of that is a wooden skeleton. Under that are some details of objects in the store, including a small skull and a metal hand. 
On the bottom left is another photo of Makoto Kobayashi smiling in his yellow shirt standing in front of the bookshelf. And then the photo on the bottom right is two wooden sculptures of animals in the foreground out of focus. And in the background in focus is a bookshelf with other various objects in front of the books. On the next page is another woodblock and newspaper artwork. The top image showing one side, you can see bits of writing from the newspaper, such as conquista, presente, pero, conquistas, te y un futuro. Below that is another side of the sculpture. Finalizo el for congreso del PPR de Campuchea elegido. And then below that is a photograph from the newspaper of men holding guns and the letters M-I-L-I. The newspaper is red, white, and black. 1.9 height by 1.9 width by 1.9 depth inches. On the next page in the bottom left is a little silver sculpture of a car. On the top right of the page is the sign of Makoto Kobayashi's Thai food spot. It is yellow with red text, and it says, Curry Thai food set. Below that is a wooden sculpture, rectangular on a wooden base, and vertically written down in white carved blocks, it says, Off. It is untitled from 2019, plastic label, woodblock, and acrylic. 7.8 height by 2.7 width by 2.7 depth inches. On the following page, we have untitled 2000 Xerox photocopied artifact collage, book pages, and lacquer on plywood, 15.7 height by 31.4 width by 2.7 depth inches. The background of the piece is red polka dots on white. On the bottom, there is an image of a ruler, one through four inches. And then in the foreground is a wooden sculpture. On the right page in the corner is the same card that we saw detailed in a photo of his shop. It has a black and white image of a woman in lingerie. It says 090-lick below that. 5425. In a bordered box, it says press. 1. Adventures with Sweet Sally. 2. Two beautiful bisexual girls. 3. Totally dominating women. And there's a red kiss mark, and on the bottom, a drawing of a phone. It says 350 per call. Tolls, if any. Adults, and then something that's hard to read, and 24 hours. The next spread is a collection of wooden sculptures. They're all untitled, and clockwise, the materials of the first one are woodblock type foundry, tiles, wing nuts, aluminum plates, steel. The dimensions are 12.5 height by 9.8 width by 1.9 depth inches. To the right of that, the sculpture is made of plastic container, various found wood objects, door handles, ceramic, steel. The dimensions are 12.5 height by 4.3 width by 4.3 depth inches. Then we have wood, acrylic, steel handle, button, pottery, steel key, 7.8 height by 3.9 width inches. Wood blocks, door handles, machine handle, rhinestones, acrylic, 12.5 height by 8.6 width by 4.7 depth inches. And then the sculpture in the center is made of electric wire, wood frames, wood block, steel, ring cones, acrylic, plastic game console buttons. The dimensions are 17.7 height by 13.7 width by 6.6 depth inches. On the next page is a piece untitled from 1985. So this piece is a drawer with various objects inside. 
including seashells, coral, insects, binocular lens, glass case, original stained glass piece, toy glasses, mannequin parts, acrylic, fabric, light bulb, metal syringe, clothing tag, and drawer. On the last page on the top right is the dizzy girl looking down at the text, and in the bottom right is the 3D Dizzy Turtle.